All right, so the other difference, and you guys, we just talked about how classification taxonomy has changed over the past, you know, couple hundred years, and especially in the last 60, 70 years, there have been some important changes in how scientists actually classify things. So up until, you know, whatever, the 1950s, 60s, how were scientists putting organisms into different groups? What was it based on? Structure. What do they look like? What parts did they have? Some cases, their ecology, their habitat, where they live, things like that. But we've realized, since we have newer um, types of technology, that sometimes those structural differences in appearance don't really fit with the relatedness of two species. And so the shift has been to move away from putting things into taxonomic groups based on their structure to putting them into taxonomic groups based on their evolutionary history. And we're able to tell the evolutionary history much more accurately today because of advances in what? What allows us now to much more definitively say, yes, this organism is closely related to this organism. Science. What specifically? Yeah, much of it is through DNA analysis. We're able to now basically take a sample of cells from an organism, basically read its DNA code. And by comparing the DNA of two different species, we can see how many changes there are, how many differences. The more differences, the longer those two species have been diverged from a common ancestor. And so some of what we knew from, some of what we used from past taxonomic groups, like the Protus Kingdom, we know today, doesn't really make any sense according to um, phylogenetic. That's what we call putting things into groups based on their evolutionary history. Um, so that's sort of the newer approach. It's, and part of that is cladistics, is looking at um, the evolutionary relationships and making sure that the groups we put things in make sense in terms of the evolutionary history of these organisms. Okay? And we, we use um, a diagram often called the cladogram that can help show this. A clade, that word, is a group of organisms that all diverge from a common ancestor. And it's often based on what we call derived characteristics. Characteristics that sort of set a group apart is one way we can look at this. For example, we look at these organisms here. This is a cladogram. Okay? And what you see is we put them in groups based on these derived characteristics. So the most Distantly related organism in this group is the hagfish, the jawless fish. Okay. One of the first types of fish that ever evolved um, in the oceans. Okay. Then we had the evolution of the jaw at some point. All of these other species share that derived characteristic. They all have a jaw. As we continue moving up, okay, we have the perch. In evolutionary history, we had the development of lungs eventually. And again, so we split off the perch, and now all these organisms have that derived characteristic. They all have lungs, okay, and claws or nails, and um, fur, mammary glands, and so forth. So as we move up that list, we can get a better sense of um, how these species are actually related. It can get much more complicated. You know, these are various clades, a cladogram, showing um, mammals and sort of the relationship between these mammals. And you know, you have the duck-billed platypuses up there at the top, that's sort of unique and different from all of these other types of mammals. The duck-billed platypus and these other species, they had a common ancestor, but quite far in the past. Versus you look a squirrel and a guinea pig, they had a common ancestor not too long ago. So they are related to each other. Right? And so um, cladistics, DNA analysis, 
allows us to create probably a more accurate representation of how species actually evolve. It allows us to classify things in a different way. So these criteria are sort of the traditional criteria of what we've used for many years to put things into kingdoms. Right? And they're things that you're familiar with. Number of cells. Organisms are either unicellular or multicellular. Some organisms inside of their cells, they have a nuclear membrane containing the DNA. Some do not. Prokaryotes have no nuclear membrane. Eukaryotes do have it. Some organisms make their own food, and others have to eat other organisms for energy autotrophs and heterotrophs. And the one you may not be familiar with is the composition of the cell wall. So we know that some types of living things have a cell wall, an outer layer beyond the cell membrane. But that cell wall can be composed of different substances, different carbohydrates or proteins. And so that cell wall composition comes into play. There's various types of molecules, and we'll talk about a couple of those. So these are some of the characteristics that we use. We still use them today. Again, today, when we're classifying organisms, we tend to go more towards the DNA and the molecular evidence versus these things, because a lot of times these don't quite fit. There's groups where Unicellular multicellular, some things are colonial and they have a bunch of cells together, but they're not quite multicellular. Um, nutrition, you know, there are certain groups that we have that some members are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs. So these things are often um, not, do not um, line up with the molecular evidence. But let's talk about the groups. So the domain bacteria. These are the prokaryotes. Okay. Um, they're unicellular. They do not have a nucleus. They're prokaryotes. Means they, they still have DNA, but it's sort of just spread throughout the cytoplasm. It's not contained within a membrane. They also generally have no other membrane-bound organelles. Uh, some bacteria are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs. Again, that's why classifying things based on their nutrition is really not the best way to do it. So some bacteria, uh, like blue green algae, things like that, cyanobacteria can go through photosynthesis. Others, strep bacteria, E. coli, they're heterotrophs. They have to consume other, other things for energy. Their cell wall, so bacteria do have a cell wall and contains a molecule called peptidoglycan. And that's a different type of cell wall from a fungus or from a plant cell. Even though they all have a cell wall, the bacterial cell wall is unique. Bacteria can reproduce asexually through producing spores or through just splitting and binary fission. They can also exchange genetic material in a process called conjugation. So they can reproduce in, in both ways. You ever had strep throat? You had an, an infection of streptococcus bacteria. Those are the ones that cause strep throat. A staph infection you may have heard about. It's caused by another type of bacteria, staphylococcus. E. coli. E. coli. There are many types of E. coli. Some are beneficial and live in our gut and help us in breaking down food and, and 
in certain vitamins, others can um, cause digestive problems, cause food poisoning. Wundering algae is a photosynthetic type of bacteria. So they vary. And oftentimes bacteria are classified by their shape, rod-shaped bacteria, sphere-shaped bacteria, spiral-shaped bacteria. There's a variety of different types. Some examples are the extremophiles, like methanogens, which can use meth methane as a source of energy. Halophiles, which live in extreme salt conditions. Thermophiles, which can live at extremes of temperature. Some of these archaea can live in um, geysers and um, deep sea vents. <coughs> in very inhospitable areas. Sorry, I'll go back. So we have the bacteria, we have the archaea, and then we have the domain we call eukarya. And eukarya are the eukaryotes. They're all in one huge domain. They have a nucleus. They have a membrane that contains their, <coughs> their DNA. They have other membrane-bound organelles within them. And they're split into four traditional kingdoms, plants, animals, okay, fungi, and protists. Um, you know, and really, ta taxonomists, what they would like to do is get rid of kingdoms here. Instead of having four kingdoms, split things into smaller groups okay, that more accurately represent their evolutionary history. Okay? This is a more cladistic approach. We have the animals, you have the fungi, and then you have some of the other groups where you know we call them now all protists, but they're not all related to each other. Okay? So you know these organisms are more closely related to fungi than they are to these other protists. So but we still are going to talk about protists and what they are. So, kingdom protista, or we call them protists. This was the catch-all. This is where scientists put things that they didn't know where to put them. They generally, they're aquatic. Um, they were always thought to be unicellular, but there are some multicellular groups here. They're eukaryotic. They have a nucleus. Their nutrition varies. Some are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs. Because we're going to talk about the, the, the types of protists. Some algae have a cell wall. Most protists do not. They can reproduce and asexually or sexually. 
So as you can see, there's like, there doesn't seem to be very much consistency here about what actually makes a protist. And that's why we call this sort of kingdom of misfits. It's just throw everything that's small and lives in the water, throw it in this group. Yeah, it almost says, except for being prokaryotic, yeah, it, it has members of the protos, yeah, they're very widely. You know, and so when we look at the, the various types of protos, there's different groups, okay, based on some, based on, um, you know, how much they move, based on how they move, based on whether or not they're photosynthetic, they're heterotrophic, different ways that you could split up this huge kingdom of random stuff. The traditional way that we talked about the protists were animal-like protists or plant-like protists. That's how they originally were classified. The protozoans, that's the word we use for the animal-like protists. The things that move around. The things that you looked at in seventh grade were protozoans. They're motile, they're movable, they, they move from place to place. And if you remember, we saw paramecium, we looked at amoeba, we looked at eulina. They had various methods of movement. The amoeba moved using pseudopods, those blob-like extensions that ooze forward. These images, we talked earlier about phase contrast microscopy. That's what these images are. They can show the detail much better. It's still a light microscope, but it's phase contrast. So we have the amoeba, the paramecium, which moves first using those tiny little cilia, those little hairs that paddle it around. The euglena has a flagellum, a tail that allows it to swim through the water. What's the one that like ate liver? That was the amoeba. It engulfs, yeah, it engulfs its food. Um, they're heterotrophic, although um, you lean up can go through photosynthesis since it has chlorophyll. These are some of the products. We're going to be looking at them again. Then there were the plant like products. They don't really belong in any in a protist group, sort of. Um, but we, that's where they were put. These are things like algae. Mostly they're non-motile. Motile. They don't move around. They're much like plants. They have a cell wall made of cellulose. They're autotrophic. We looked at or tried to look at the spirogyra. Like protists. Kelp grows in, so even though generally we think of protists as microscopic, unicellular organisms, kelp, which grows in big, um, like plant like things, is uh, an example. It's also protists. Diatoms, which form these interestingly shaped um, casts. Plankton. Little unicellular uh, protists that live in the water that form the basis of much of the aquatic food chain. Bowl box, these little circular um, protists. Just a wide variety here. Alright, so we move out of protists and we move into another kingdom, the fungi. Many of these fungi are decomposers, they break down. Dead tissue. They're mostly multicellular, but there's some unicellular fungi, yeast. They are eukaryotic, of course, because they're in the eukarya domain. They are heterotrophic. They need to consume. 
other organisms for energy. And they do this using what we call extracellular digestion. You know what that would mean? Extracellular digestion. Brandon? It happens outside of the cell. It happens outside of the cell. Fungus secretes digestive enzymes onto whatever it's breaking down, and then it's broken down, and then they absorb the nutrients. You know, think about a mushroom growing on a, you know, a dead log. It's secreting digestive enzymes. It's breaking down that log, rotting, you might say, decaying it, and then it absorbs its nutrients from there. They have a cell wall made of chitin, another molecule that's often present in various types of living things, but different from cellulose. They reproduce using spores, budding. They can reproduce sexually through the exchange of genetic material. Some examples, mushrooms are a fungus, mold, fungus, mildew, yeast that we use for baking and brewing, it's a fungus. sexually and asexually. Pollen is a male reproductive cell in plants. There are ovules or egg cells that are female reproductive cell. And in pollination, those cells are fertilized and begin to grow into an embryo or what we might call a seed. They can also reproduce asexually through runners and cuttings and tubers and other, other methods that we'll talk about eventually. There's really two main groups of plants, bryophytes and tracheophytes. If we look at sort of their evolutionary uh, history, they evolved from sort of algae. Um, and over time, they diverged into various groups, um, you know, which include modern algae, and then the bryophytes, and mosses, ferns, uh, conifers, which we call gymnosperms, and angiosperms. So they diverged into these different groups. The bryophytes are one you may not be as familiar with. Okay? Bryophytes are what we call non-vascular plants. What does that mean? What do you think non-vascular means? They don't breathe. Not quite breathe. Vascular? Like cardiovascular disease? They don't have a heart. <laughs> they don't this is true, they Sebastian. They don't have a nucleus. No. They don't they do have a nucleus. You just said they were eukaryotes. What else? They lack true roots. Um, not quite. <laughs> But that's not about non-vascular. So vascular, in terms of, in general, means vessels, means sort of tubes. Non-vascular plants, um, they don't have these vessels relocating water or nutrients around the plant. Kind of like you imagine an animal without a circulatory system. Okay? And so they don't have um, these 
vessels, they don't have true roots or stems or leaves like you might think of typically as a plant would have. They don't have vascular bundles, which we call the xylem and the phloem, that other vascular plants have. They generally go low to the ground in moist, shady environments. Because they have no means of relocating these substances around, they need to be pretty small so they can absorb water um, directly into their cells. Moss is an example. That's the one you're probably most familiar with. Mosses that grow on rocks and in shady areas. Those are bryophytes, the non-vascular plants. They liver, these are liver worms. You probably see those when you go hiking or you go walking through the woods. Most of the plants that we're familiar with are tracheophytes, vascular plants. They have roots, they have stems, they have leaves. And they're vascular because they have these tubes, the xylem and the phloem, which transport material through the plant. The xylem transports water. And generally, these plants take water in through their roots, but they need to relocate that water up through the leaves and to the other parts of the plant. If you have trouble remembering, I think if you like are rocking out on the xylophone, you're going to need to drink some water because you're going to be sweating so much. I you guys play the xylophone? Yeah. Who does? You guys do? Maybe you play it? It's not even called the xylophone, right? What's the thing? The vibe. Oh, the vibe is the vibe. They're on vibe. Same idea. I like the same thing. Maybe a xylophone is not an actual thing. Um, and then there's the phloem, which transports sugar and nutrients. And a lot of oftentimes these are relocated from the leaves where these sugars are made into the other parts of the plant. transports water, one transports sugar, nutrients. So examples are ferns and plants and trees. And most of what you would think about are um, vascular plants. Then we reach our, our last kingdom, kingdom animalia, animal kingdom. Again, animals are multicellular, eukaryotic, heterotrophic. They do not have a cell wall on their cell. They can reproduce. Um, most of them reproduce sexually, but there are some that can reproduce asexually. And most are, are motile, they're movable, they move around from place to place, but not all. Some are the opposite, which we call sessile, meaning they're sort of stuck in place for most of their lives. Things like barnacles, coral, sponges, they don't generally move around. If we look at our various groups of animals, they um, evolve from types of protists. And if you look at sort of how they evolve, we have the simple animals like the sponges, okay? Then we have things like the nadarians, we have things with radial symmetry, no body cavity, the worms, the mollusks, annelids, the segmented animals, up until we get to um, the most more complex animals, which are the chordae. So we'll get into some more detail with animals. We'll go through some specific phyla. And we we'll learned a little bit about some of these. So periphera, these are the sponges. They're filter feeders, they're aquatic, they live in the water. Um, they have asymmetry. They're just sort of shaped randomly. They're sessile, they don't move from place to place. They can reproduce asexually and just sort of split off or they can reproduce sexually. They don't have any, so if you remember, our organization of life, some species have cells that work together to form tissues, and tissues that work together to form organs, and so forth. Um, 
they have the very simplest level of organization. They don't have any tissues, they don't have any organs. They're basically just a collection of individual cells. Okay. They come in a wide variety of shapes, colors, sizes, but they all are filter feeders. They take water in through the pores, through their openings, and then they expel it. And along the way, they filter out little bits of food that they use for their nutrition. Then we have the nadarians, or the selenerates, they're sometimes called as well. These are sort of sac-like organisms. They, have, they do have true tissues, but just in two layers. They generally have radial symmetry. They're also aquatic. They have one body opening where food goes in and then waste leaves. And many of these have stinging cells. You may know, you ever got stung by a jellyfish? It's a nadarian. It hurts. It hurts bad, I know. They have these stinging cells called nematocysts, which they can use for feeding and for protection. We looked at this before. This is a hydra. Coral are nadarians, okay. and jellyfish as well. Yep, they stink. Platyhelminthes. Flat rhymes with flat. These are flatworms. Flatworms have bilateral symmetry, two-part symmetry. They also have just one body opening for food to go in and waste to leave. Many are parasites, but not all. This is a planaria, this is not a parasite. What we looked at has those uh, ability to regenerate, you remember from seventh grade. This is a tapeworm. Tapeworms are flatworms, okay? This is a fluke, another free-living, non-parasitic type of flatworm. Okay? And flatworms, oh, that's so disgusting. Flatworms are parasites. These are tapeworms are intestinal parasites oftentimes. Another group are called the roundworms. These are nematodes. Nematodes, another type of worm. They're not segmented like the other worms. They have bilateral symmetry. They have two body openings. They reproduce actually many nematodes are parasites, including the parasites that cause heartworm. So this is this is the heart of a dog that died of heartworm, and its heart is completely clogged with nematodes that cause heartworm. Okay? Some do affect humans as well. This is a Scarus lumbricoides. This is a roundworm. It's found, um, it's an a intestinal parasite, a Scarus it's called. Okay? This is a person's bowel, their large intestine, completely clogged with these worms which have reproduced and grown you inside. Do you, do die? Do you, you just die because of it? Yeah. You could die, yes. Yeah. You could die if it becomes so bad that they clog the flow of food through your digestive tract. Like that? Yeah, like that. So that guy's dead. Yeah, well that's his, yeah, probably. All right, we'll finish up with annelids. Annelids are another type of worm. These are the segmented worms. They have bilateral symmetry again, two body openings, a mouth and an anus. They are more complex than all the other worms. So put your stuff way up, please. Listen. They're more complex than the other worms. They have true tissue, they have organs, organ systems. Um, so they're the more com most complex of the worms. They include earthworms and um, leeches. Earthworms are very good for the soil. These are earthworm castings, the waste of earthworm. Probably when you were a kid, you picked them up and smushed them. You thought they were just little clumps of, of mud. They were not. Those were earthworm castings. That was the waste products of earthworms that were oh. through them. And leeches are included under the annelids, the segmented word. Okay, we'll finish up with our animal groups tomorrow, and then we're going to work on a lab. What is the lab? No homework. No. We need to finish our notes before we can finish that last lab. And we're going to start a new lab tomorrow, so you'll have some homework for next week. No.